I'm reading from Psalm 16, page 549 in the Church Bible. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, You are my Lord. Apart from you I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones, in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour out their libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. The second reading is taken from the book of Mark, chapter 13, verses 1 through to 8. Church Bible, page 1. Zero, one, nine, ten, nineteen. Then as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and buildings are here? And Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another. That will not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will all these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? And Jesus, answering them, began to say, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I'm he, and will deceive many. But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled, for such things must happen. But the end is not yet, for nations will rise against nations and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles these are the beginning of service. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce Tony um, Thompson from Hope Church, and he'll be leading um, the word today. As he comes up, we can I just ex- as you just extend your hand, we can just bless him and um, and pray for him. Do you want to come up? So, Father God, we praise you and we give you thanks for Tony and his work at Hope Church. We thank you, Lord, for bringing him here this morning. And we pray by your spirit you anoint him and you will place in his heart and his mouth your words. May he have confidence in you. And I pray that we as a church, we have hearts ready to receive them. So come, Lord Jesus, have your way with us. Let us hear your voice this morning. Amen. Now, whether I'd be able to... Oh, I can hear myself now. Good. Good. It's just a case of... I. I my eyesight is getting worse and worse and worse, and sometimes I find that I print it out on large things, and I still can't see it properly. So you may find me scratching for my glasses, but I'm not clever enough to be able to wear very focals or anything. So if I have my reading glasses on, I can't see your lovely faces and, and things like that. But it's great to be here. 
And it's, it's, it's lovely to, to see uh, faces that I recognise, people that I, I know. And it's, a, it's just lovely, isn't it, to be part of the, the body of Christ. And that even though uh, we worship in different sort of places, have slightly different styles and flavours, but actually we're one. And so to be able to, to come here representing the, the, the body of Christ is, is, is a privilege and a joy and to, to share fellowship with you is special. Um, so thank you for inviting me. Thank you for welcoming me. And I look forward to um, sharing my heart with you this morning. Um, the readings... Uh, which was sent to me a few weeks ago, spoke to me as I sort of reflected on them about how things don't always happen as we expect. And then to reflect what's happened over this weekend, just events confirm it, don't they? And just in terms of the Matthew 13 passage, wars and rumours of wars... Um, and they're there in scripture yet I guess you the same as me we're still shocked by them and I think we are meant to be shocked but the world is not a good place it's not an easy place and I'm, I'm now a grandfather and think I find myself thinking the word a bit through the eyes of a grandfather for those of you who are parents you'll see your things through the eyes of of parents but you just sometimes wonder what sort of world are we bringing our kids into what does the future look like for them and the answer comes in a sense in the psalm that was read alongside Mark 13 we have to hold on to God our hope is in him and whatever the circumstances that we face, we have to hold on to God. And what I want to, to do, what I, what I felt to do, is to, to share something about what do we do when things don't happen as we expect, out of the life of Moses, and particularly the early life of Moses. Now, you're probably all aware of this, um, and... I watched films recently, uh, was it Moses, Prince and King or something like that, and there's all sort of other films about it. It's very popular, but I think it's worth just reflecting something about Moses. The people of God are in slavery in Egypt, and the Egyptians are fearful of the growing population. And so they operated a very barbaric form of population control. Uh, of recent times, population control in China has been uh, in the headlines of uh, one child family, which has been relaxed to maybe let them have two. The Egyptians were far worse. Their population control was just to kill male babies. But one family who had a male baby were very creative and they put the baby boy, baby child in a basket and let it float before Pharaoh's daughter as she was bathing. And she saw the baby as they'd expected, fell in love with him and adopted the child Moses. But then got Moses' uh, uh, natural family to look after him. And Moses became aware, clearly, because of that link with Pharaoh's daughter, Pharaoh's court, and also with his own natural family of his background. And we're told of this period at the end of late adolescence, I guess, early, te early 20s. In the book of Hebrew, it talks about, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as a son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his 
reward. Very positive things mentioned about Moses. But actually, if you read in Exodus, it wasn't quite as simple as that. What he got involved in was breaking up a fight. One of the people was killed. His own people got frightened by him. And using a proper theological term, it all went pear-shaped. He had to leave Egypt and then spent half of his lifetime in exile in Midian, where he settled, where he had a family. And it was there that God spoke to him again and called him to do what he'd previously tried to do. But he'd previously tried to do it in his own strength. And you have the well-known story of the burning bush. God calls Moses, and what does Moses say? Go on, you can read. He says, no! God calls him again, and he says again, no! God says a third time, go and save my people. And he says, no, send someone else. Moses, at this point, is totally insistent that he's not going to do it. God is totally insistent that he should. And even we're told in the passage that God got to the stage where he was angry with Moses. But decides and agrees that he will send Aaron with Moses and Mer Moses and Aaron go to do the work of God. And just as an aside here, when things go pear-shaped, and you and I know that theological term, because in our lives, things go pear-shaped at times, don't they? When you try to do something, you think you're doing it right, but it goes totally wrong. It has consequences. And it does something to us, as it did to Moses. It can trample our enthusiasm. It can spoil our willingness to step out. When things go pear-shaped, when we know we've got it wrong, we become fearful of getting it wrong again, which is what happened to Moses. But in the end, God is insistent God overcomes all that resistance within Moses. And Moses does what God asks him to do. And Moses even starts performing mighty miracles in the name of the Lord. Finally, everything seems to be in shape for Moses to do what he was made and called to do. He's in the will of God. He's finally being obedient. And that's where we pick up the story. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go, so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Then the slave drivers and the overseers went out and said to the people, This is what Pharaoh says, I will not give you any more straw. Go and get your own straw wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced at all. So the people scattered all over Egypt to gather stubble to use for straw. The slave Slave drivers kept pressing them, saying, Complete the work required of you for each day, just as you had when you had straw. And Pharaoh's slave drivers beat the Israelite overseers they'd appointed, demanding, Why haven't you met your quota of bricks yesterday or today as before? Then the Israelites, Israelite overseers went and appealed to Pharaoh, Why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet we are told make bricks. Your servants are being beaten, but the fault is with your own people. Pharaoh said, lazy. That's what you are, lazy. 
That is why you keep saying, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now get to work. You will not be given any straw, yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. The Israelite overseers realized they were in trouble when they were told you are not to reduce the number of bricks required of you for each day. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, May the Lord look, look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. So Moses is not wanted to be considered the son of Pharaoh's daughter. But the way he went about it was all wrong and it went pear-shaped. Moses then spent many years in the wilderness but he was then called again by God. He resisted that call, even told God to send somebody else. But God insisted. So his obedience, he started performing miracles. And you would imagine he expected now everything to go great. But it didn't. He's clearly doing God's will even if reluctantly but he's still not successful things still are not going as you would expect them to and the question that I want to ask this morning for Moses but also for us is why and I think the answer is just to save you having to listen to the rest of the sermon if you want to doff off to sleep, is the importance of preparation. God is really wanting us to grow as people, not just to get things done. And I think that's crucial in the world that we're living in at the moment, with all the sense of wars and rumours of wars, all the sense of challenge and just that real sense of us having to be rocks in the midst of storms that are blowing up all over the place. God wants us to be his people standing firm. And so let's look at the lessons for Moses, lessons for me, Tony, and the lessons maybe for you. I'd sit for Moses and me because I can be confident that that's true. It was true for Moses, it's true for me. Is it true for you? First of all, I've had to learn, Moses had to learn how to handle disappointments. Have you learned, do you know how to handle disappointments? And partly, the issue about disappointments is expectations. If you have the wrong expectations, you will continually be disappointed. But all of us have to learn to handle disappointments. And we'd rather not, but the Bible is full of examples of disappointments, where things don't happen as you expect them. And I've learnt the only way to handle disappointments is to be disappointed. You can't handle disappointments theoretically. It's only when disappointments come that you learn to handle them. Jesus, in Luke 4, he announces who he is. Reading from the prophet Isaiah. And what happens at the end of it? They tried to kill him. My, just an aside here. My, uh, in one of my uh, situations outside the, the church where the uh, majority of people aren't Christians, there's a conflict that's happened in the midst of it. And I have been seeking to be Christ in the midst and trying to bring some reconciliation, trying to things together. And I was talking 
to my wife about this and saying about what I was trying to do to get her wisdom and her advice and saying I was just trying to be Christ in the midst of it all and her wisdom to me was and you know what happened to him don't you <laughs> Paul was converted on the Damascus road meets with the risen Lord Jesus and again what's the outcome of that they tried to kill him and then he spent many years in Tarsus before God called him to the things that he was meant to do we can think that our lives will go smoothly but scripture says experience says we will face disappointments God wants us early on to learn how to handle disappointments it's a prerequisite to success when we read biographies so often we jump to the end of the story of the great things that God does with these people and we skip and sometimes even the biographers skip the bits that go beforehand before they become usable by God the development of the leader and I could, I, I could list lots of them but just, just two that I, I, I read uh, both biographies by uh, Roy Hattersley who is, is not a Christian but as a, a socialist he valued the legacy of Christians of the past William Booth, the Salvation Army greatly used of God but the first half of his life he couldn't fit into any church he tried to be a, a ordained in different churches none of them would have him he went through half a lifetime of disappointment before he was used of God John Wesley beforehand uh, the founder of the Methodist church greatly used of God in his time but at one stage in the early stage I went to convert the Indians but who will convert me and a sense of frustration and disappointment and powerlessness of him having to learn and cope with that before God used him. And it's a very different lesson than just learning to do things in our own strength. So, so Moses, when he uh, went pear-shaped the first time, when he tried to break up the fight, what he had to learn then was that you can't do things in your own strength. He was trying to meet a need that he wasn't meant to meet. He was trying to do things in his own timing rather than God's timing. He learnt those lessons, but he also needed to learn the lesson of disappointment is that when you do everything right, when you know that you're in God's will, you know that you are serving him, you're doing what he called you to do, it can still go wrong. You can still be disappointed. And that's the lesson that we need to learn. When we do it right, it doesn't mean everything will happen as we expect or like it to. That's an important lesson that we have to learn. Second lesson that I have to learn, Moses had to learn, and maybe you need to learn, is obedience is more important than success. Success is so attractive. And culturally, certainly the culture that I come from, it's such a powerful pull. I want to look good. I want to be seen to be successful. And I know that I'm so easily motivated by success. And I know just personality-wise, wanting to win is more important than just taking part. 
And people can tell you, oh, it's the taking of part that's, that's most important. But deep down, I know it's winning that's important. And I want to do well. I want to be the best. But I also know that God wants us to be motivated by obedience. To do his will. And too often, even within the church, we're motivated by success. We want our church to be successful. We compare ourselves with other people, but also we compare our churches with other churches. I know as a church leader, too often I go to conferences, I go to meetings, and I'm taught how to lead a successful church. And by successful church, it means a growing church, or it means this type of church, or it means that type of church. Who defines what success is? Who determines what this goal that we're looking to to achieve is? And in the midst of all the turmoil that's going on in the world, in the midst of the threats that we're facing, I think it's so important that we learn this lesson that God wants us to be obedient. To him, that's what success is. Are you being obedient to him? Are you being faithful to him? Are you doing what he's called you to do? Leave the results to him. I don't know, none of us know, what the future is going to be like. Mark 13 says, wars, rumors of wars, famine, difficulties. We have relatively, in our lifetimes, lived in a period of unprecedented peace and expansion. Where the church has at one level declined, but has had a level of influence and affluence. We don't know whether the future is going to be like that. All the signs are it's not. And I think we have to learn to be obedient. Which is what Moses was having to learn what I have to learn. And then we need to go back to God. When things don't go as we expect to, we need to go for God. And so the verse that follows the verses that I read, Moses returned to the Lord and said, Why, Lord? Why have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. When things don't go as we expect, there's a great danger of becoming bitter, of feeling God is a liar. We have done our bit. God, you haven't done yours. Why have you allowed that to happen? I stepped out in faith. I was obedient to you. And look at what's happened. What kind of God are you? Now, of course, we don't say it because we've been learned you don't talk to God like that. But it doesn't stop you feeling it. You just don't voice it. And the Psalms, as we read this morning, the Psalms are full of examples of people saying what we think we're not allowed to say. Moses here saying what we would think he's not allowed to say. The Psalms, Moses, help us to express 
how we feel rather than how we think we ought to feel. So when things don't go as we expect, when we feel that level of disappointment, we need to learn to go back to God. We need to go back to God expressing our frustrations, our disappointments, expressing how we feel. We need to learn if God is going to use us, if we're going to grow to maturity, we have to learn to be honest. Particularly honest with God. Not put on this mask, and you know, I can say this as a visitor, we know how to put on our good Christian Sunday mask. And you may be frustrated with God, you may be disappointed with God, but you know how to hide it and, and live behind this facade and, and come and smile at everybody on a Sunday, but inside feel disappointed. The Bible's not like that. Yeah. How many of us would have prayed and talked to God like that? How many of us would talk to God like people in the Psalms talk to God? We need to learn to. Because we're not honest, we don't express those feelings, we just get bitter inside. We need to learn to go back to God and to deal honestly with God about how we feel. But we also need to learn the importance of listening to God. Not just hearing what we want to hear. So hidden in the call of Moses in Exodus 13, as Exodus 3, when Moses was called in the burning bush, God very clearly said, but I know that the king of Egypt will ne not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. We so often hear what we want to hear. And it's easy to miss what God actually says. So like in terms of the Paris bombings and what's happening, it just you know, the fact that Mark 13 was our reading for this morning it's there in the Bible. We should expect atrocities to happen. We shouldn't be surprised that horrendous things happen in the world. God warned us. God told us. And yet, most of the time, we don't hear it. Because we don't want to hear it. I had an evening within our local church when a group of us were, were just... Um, it was a, a training session, really, a learning session. There was a prophetic word that had been brought, and so I gathered some people and said, OK, let's weigh this word. We're told to weigh prophetic words. What was interesting, we all saw, as people had this prophetic word that was given to us as a church, the end of it was a bit vague but everybody read into it with great confidence what they wanted to hear so the group about five of us what they understood by the last part of this prophetic word was all very different but all consistent with what they felt God was saying and they as we then worked out read into that word from God what they wanted it to say. But it's not just prophetic words. We read the Bible and we hear what we want to hear. We make heroes of the Bible like Moses and he's a rightfully as a hero he was greatly used of God but we miss all the development all the hard times all the struggles 
we don't put ourselves fully in his place and think that actually when he was born there was genocide and the male children were all being killed and he was saved miraculously by God. We don't put ourselves in the position of thinking what was his family feeling like? We don't think of the fact that half of his lifetime was in exile because he'd know that he'd done wrong. And the fact that when God called him, he said no three times because there's no way that he wants to serve God. We don't learn, we don't see in the Bible that even when he did it right, it didn't go right as he expected right from the beginning. We read in the Bible, we read what we want to hear that being a Christian will be easy and straightforward and will be triumphant all the while. Now, of course, we are more than conquerors in Christ and I'm not wanting to play down the victory and the success. We all but there's preparation. It's not always straightforward. And there is hard times and there's struggle. And we learn and we grow through that because God is bigger than us. But we do need to hear what God is saying and not just hear what we want him to say and that's part of the preparation that's part of the learning so to close just in summary I don't think there's any such thing as an overnight success There's so much preparation that goes in as in the example of Moses. Now I'll give you into a bit of a secret. Two things that I find really difficult and causes problems in my house. I hate cooking. I like eating, but I hate cooking. And I hate DIY. I am the husband from hell. Why do I hate cooking and why do I hate DIY? Because I do know that the secret to both of them is preparation. I don't mind DIY, but it's it's rubbing down. I can slap paint on. It's all the rubbing down, all the preparing. Cooking, you can sling something in the oven. It's all that preparation that goes beforehand. I want to make something. I want to be made. But important things, it's all about the preparation. And with us as God's people, it's all about the preparation. With Moses, it was all about the preparation. In the turmoil and the conflict of this world, God is about preparing for himself a bride. Us. Moses was mightily used of God. There's no doubt about that. But that was the result of many years of preparation. And I would just encourage you this morning, how is your relationship with God? On the, on the journey that I've, I've painted with terms of Moses, do you know where you are on it? Is there a sense that you're like Moses when he was in exile that you know that actually there's a sense of going through the motions a little bit and that if God called you and maybe God is calling you but there's a sense I don't want to get it wrong again and a reluctance to really step out is there a sense of I've been obedient 
but things aren't still working out as I want them to and are questioning or maybe none of this is relevant and that you're just on fire for God and that you are seeking just to be obedient and leaving the results to him I don't know but I think the important thing is you should know where are you and seek to be real and honest with God and to seek to move forward allow God to prepare you so that we can be the people that God wants us to be